never had Wingstop? Bruh, you're missing out. This video is sponsored by Raycon. My go-to pair of ear- Hey, guys, my next video is sponsored by Raycon. So I'm sorry. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. There's his code. There's his code. But my next video is sponsored by Raycon, so. Use my code when my, when my code comes up. Actress Ada Constance Kent was born in England around the year of 1880 Wait, and spent familiar. most of her working life in and around the theatres of London's West End. She made a brief transition to motion pictures in the late 1930s, with uncredited roles in Princess O'Hara and Tomorrow's Children. But unfortunately for Ada, her career accomplishments aren't the reason that she's still remembered today. After failing to score any leading roles, Ada announced that she was retiring. Intro? Um... Give me a second. Give me a second. I'm thinking. 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 from acting, and promptly moved to the small village of Fingering Ho, Essex. No snickering now. Ada was a reclusive soul who never social- Fingering Ho. <laughs> Ho, Essex. No snickering now. Ada was a reclusive soul who never socialized with the other locals, and who was rarely seen around the village. Her elusive nature and past fame made her all the more mysterious to the other villagers, who often gossiped about the wealthy actress turned hermit who lived amongst them. Is that where your mom? But their interest in Ada only truly peaked. Thank you, Matthew Small. Would you ever view an animated Batman movie? There's way too many. Isn't there? Isn't there like a lot of animated Batman movies? Superheroes just not my cup of tea. I'm an I'm an anime nerd, so superheroes nah. When she suddenly and inexplicably disappeared from the face of the earth. In late March of 1939, a tradesman knocked on Ada's front door, but she didn't answer. A gardener named Reuben G. Winkle claimed to have spotted her bedroom light on the previous night. So initially, nobody was too concerned. The eccentric woman had a habit of wandering off for long periods of time. But three months later, when a friend came to visit Ada at her cottage and found that it was still empty, she was officially declared a missing person. Two local constables visited the cottage to investigate Constable. the matter. Curiously, they found that the front door had been left unlocked. A dinner tray with a fully prepared meal Missing out? I'm sorry, I've seen so many superhero things, and I'm not missing out, because I've seen a lot of it, and I, I, I'm, I just, I can't get into it. I'm sorry. Neil on it, sat on the kitchen table. An open copy of Romeo and- You know what it's like? It's like, it's like eating vanilla ice cream. Like, I feel like when you watch superhero movies, every single time it just feels like I'm just eating vanilla ice cream. You know, does that make sense? It's plain. It's very plain. It's not not much to it. You know, I've 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 had it so many times. You know, like I I I I I've always I know what vanilla tastes like. I know exactly what it tastes like. I know the ins and outs of vanilla. That that's vanilla. Try something not MCU. I have. You think I just watch MCU? No. I've seen plenty of other shit. I don't like it. <laughs> I just don't. I'm sorry. I'm not saying vanilla's bad. I'm saying it's basic. There's something, there's something wrong about vanilla. It's just basic. Watch Batman Forever. I have seen Batman Forever. It's all right, but it's still basic. All right. 
pig didn't have cable growing up and it shows? How does me not not liking superheroes have to do with me not having cable? What? <laughs> Jet Blue, thank you for this 10. Not even regular vanilla, but the fake vanilla flavor that comes from a beaver's butt. Sorry, but not sorry. See, at least I didn't say that. All right? At least I didn't say that. Juliet was resting on an armchair, and Ada's coat. Do you like at least the boys? I do not like the boys. Uh, it, it's just, it's, you know, the basic, oh, superhero, but what if superhero bad? You know? It's, it's, it's basic. It's vanilla. Invincible? Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. It's good, don't get me wrong, but it's still the same. I've seen it before. Oh, superhero, but what if superhero? What if Superman was the bad guy? You know? The Incredibles? The Incredibles is not vanilla. Dude, that, that's different. I feel like that's a little bit different. I mean, I guess you could consider it superheroes. But I don't know. I feel like there's more to it. Mega Mind? But that, okay, that's different. That's not just superhero. Peacemaker? I haven't seen it. Okay, we're supposed to be watching this video, guys. My Hero Academia? The newest season's good. Uh, I'd say the newest season is definitely getting better. Was Moving still on. hanging on the rack. It seemed that wherever she had gone, she had left in a hurry. Thank you, Corka. Yes, I've seen Gargoyles. Otherwise, everything else was as it should have been. There were no signs of foul play, and nothing to suggest that Ada hadn't left of her own free will. Three years passed without anyone seeing or hearing from Ada. One of her concerned friends, a man named George Wicknell, travelled to her cottage in hopes of finding some trace of the missing spinster. George thoroughly searched each of the cottage's rooms, but found no useful clues that would indicate what happened to his wayward friend. All was quiet for nine long years, until, finally, Ada's bank manager noticed something unusual. Dude, I swore he said Ada's spank manager. Because it was Ada's bank manager, but Ada spank. It sounded like spank. All right, sorry. Since she was considered missing and not dead, Ada's accounts had remained open. Though for almost a decade, not a single transaction had taken place. Then, suddenly, in September 1948, someone had made several large deposits into her account. The bank manager quickly contacted the local police, and for a brief period, the investigation into Ada's disappearance was reopened. On a hunch, detectives decided to once again search her cottage. But unlike before, the house wasn't empty. Uh -oh. Sitting in a wooden chair in one of the cottage's front rooms was a fully dressed skeleton. And lying next to it, an empty bottle simply labelled Poison. Oh, oh, wh what? What? Naturally, the discovery horrified local law enforcement, who had already conducted several fruitless searches of the cottage. Coroners from Scotland Yard conducted a thorough examination of the remains, and in a bizarre twist, they noted that the skeleton was larger than one, but fitting Ada's small stature, and more closely resembled a male's frame. As such, they couldn't conclusively state whether it belonged to Ada or not. Small tufts of hair still attached. I, I just imagine, because how I imagine this is like the dudes, you know, the people who probably kidnapped her or killed her or something like that, just put up a skeleton <laughs> in clothes and just put, just got a, a bottle, wrote poison on it, just set it next to it. They'll never know. They'll never know. <laughs> 
Like they think they're some fucking geniuses. They're just going to assume she drank poison and she died. They'll never get it. They'll never know. Match the skull, matched with hairs found on a brush in the bedroom, prompting a coroner's jury to conclude that the bones were Ada's, though many people aren't so sure. A number of independent homicide investigators have since come forward with the same horrifying theory. That the skeleton wasn't Ada. If true, that raises a huge number of other questions. Most obviously, who did it belong to? Had a homeless person snuck into Ada's abandoned cottage for the night and ended their own existence? If it was a male, why were they wearing women's clothing? Did somebody in the nearby Poison area have X, a body X, that they needed X, to dispose me, of and thought they could pass it off as Ada? Did a sinister individual want to exhibit their handiwork? All investigators knew was that there hadn't been a skeleton in the cottage during their past searches, and now there was. Frustratingly, a cause of death couldn't be determined. While the bottle clearly suggested that the victim had been poisoned, there was no way of proving that by skeletal analysis alone. Nor were experts able to determine if the person had perished inside the cottage or elsewhere. After yet another round of police questioning, a villager claimed to have spotted Ada during her final days, overnight. and said that when Ada had entered the Whalebone pub on the 6th of March, just a couple of weeks before she vanished, she had looked extremely poorly. <clears throat> Reportedly, she was very pale and was almost continuously coughing during a brief exchange with the owner. It was Poison X. This has led some to suggest that Ada was very ill. They theorize that she had simply taken a long trip away from the village, returned at some point thereafter, and passed away of natural causes inside her cottage. Yet there are others who suggest that her symptoms and the bottle. So she passed away for 10 years and no one bothered to check on her? What? were evidence of murder by poisoning. And as it stands, this case remains shrouded in mystery, and given how old it is, that's not likely to change. Honestly, there's very little information about this case online, well, they probably and of the reports that the do points. exist, many seem to conflict with one another. As such, we can't- Hmm, she died. I wonder if it has something to do with this bottle that says poison. Say for certain what exactly happened to Ada. Whether she upped and left to spend her final years elsewhere, or whether she was butchered. Whether the remains were hers or not. We also can't say who paid the money into her account nine years after she vanished, or why. All we can say with certainty is that Ada's end was even more dramatic than her career. Yeah, the, a body the money appearing out of weird. thin air. A bottle labelled The Poison, poison. For mysterious bank deposits appearing, Cusco's as if meant poison. to reignite the case. Cusco's it all seems so fittingly theatrical. Peter. Those involved in this next Our mystery haven't officially been named by the authorities yet. So to avoid saying the man and the woman ad nauseum, I'll instead be using pseudonyms. On the evening of March 9th, 2022, a man in the northern French region of Ur named Luc telephoned his former partner, Ugh. Marie, and told her a horrifying story. The 46-year-old carpenter sounded drunk as he explained how he had gotten into a traffic accident, one in which he had slammed his car into a female cyclist. <clears throat> Marie was of course troubled to hear that, and asked if everything was alright. Luke babbled on one? about how he had reported the incident to the cops, and how it had been the biker's fault and not his own. He insisted that the cyclist was in good health, but the damage to the windscreen of his Audi French suggested otherwise. Ugh. A friend of Marie's must have suspected that something was up, since he drove past Luke's home that very same evening, and stopped to take photographs of his car. There was a large, circular impact dent on the windscreen, which had a, quote, red mark in the centre. After being forwarded the photos, Marie contacted the local police. Contrary to her ex-husband's claims, no such accident report had been filed. Furious about the deception, Marie attempted to contact Luke by telephone, 
and after three days of radio silence, she drove over to his home to demand answers. When she arrived on the Marie morning of March 12th, bed. Marie spotted Luke's Aldi, along with the damage it sustained in the collision. But she also noticed traces of what appeared to be blood on the right side of the vehicle. After knocking on the front door of his home for a sustained period, she concluded that no one was home. 24 hours later, Luke called her up, and it was during this call Sus? that he made a stunning confession. He admitted that he may have downplayed what actually happened after the crash on March 9th. The truth was that he had struck a cyclist at high speed whilst under the influence of alcohol, and said that her wounds had actually been fatal. Then, instead of calling the police, he put the bike and her body in the trunk of his car, and went looking for a shovel with which to dig her grave. Here we go. After a brief trip back home, Luke then drove to a secluded area, dug a deep pit, and prepared to drag the cyclist to her final resting place. Yet, upon wow. opening up the trunk, he discovered that the woman was still alive and was weakly begging for help. In a decision so callous that it defies- uh... I don't, I just don't, why, 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 why'd you do it, why'd you do it, Stephen, why? Comprehension, Luke didn't help her, but instead bludgeoned her to death with the shovel. To him, slaying her was preferable to facing the consequences of a DUI. <laughs> the man went. Rather kill someone than deal with a DUI. Kept down the line and begged his ex-wife not to reveal his dark secret. Overcome with the burden of a guilty conscience, Marie went to her local police station two months later, and accused her ex-partner of murder, telling them everything that he had confessed to her. An investigation was opened into the cyclist's disappearance, but no corresponding missing persons report had been filed, so it was impossible to know who exactly had been killed. However, Police did manage to talk to the former girlfriend of the accused, who claimed that she had spoken with him around the time of the alleged murder. The girl claimed Luke had called her and said that he wasn't well in the head. When she asked why, he seemed unwilling to talk about it, but eventually confessed to, quote, I guess knocking down an old lady when at the her. wheel of his car and having killed her before burying her. Once the police were given the photographs of the damaged Audi, they knew that securing the vehicle would be the key to conviction. Yet, when- Do you understand how a DUI can ruin someone's life? Wait, are, are you joking? Are you being ironic? I hope you're being ironic. Dozens of police officers descended on Luke's property. His car was nowhere to be found. I really hope you're being ironic. Luke claimed that his car had been stolen the night before. The vehicle was later found abandoned and burned in a secluded, wooded area. Luke feigned ignorance, claiming that he wasn't responsible for destroying the vehicle, yet the scorching of such a crucial yes, piece I of am. evidence- Yes, I am? Alright. I'm sorry- Dude, my chat is so unhinged, I don't know anymore. <laughs> like, I don't know. It was too suspicious for the French authorities <clears throat> to overlook, and even without a body, they promptly took Luke in on suspicion of murder. During his initial round of questioning, Luke claimed that he had made up the entire story about the cyclist, in hopes of it bringing him closer to his ex, Marie. Hey babe, I know we broke up, but like, I just killed this girl. Uh, threw her body in the trunk and buried her. So, you want to go out to dinner sometime? You know? What? He claimed that it was nothing but a kind of prank, and that he had damaged his own car before spreading chicken prank, blood on it. Bro. It was a prank, At that bro! Point, investigators showed him the photos of his damaged vehicle. After being confronted by those images, Luke admitted that he had hit a cyclist after all, but once again insisted that they had ridden away unharmed. Luke also admitted to setting fire to his own car, but after that, he stopped talking entirely. 
he never indicated where he may have hidden his victim. Luke has since been the subject to additional rounds of questioning, and has even made an appearance in court. Yet, until the cyclist's remains are uncovered, a conviction is highly unlikely. The authorities are convinced that Luke is guilty of taking a cyclist's life, and that they're only a hair's breadth away from putting him behind bars. But as it stands, time is ticking away. The investigation is unlikely to progress until a missing persons report can be linked to the case, as with no clue to the identity of the victim, punishing the killer is almost impossible. French police have since stated that they believe the victim may not have been reported missing Imagine and may have been living alone and isolated at know, the time right? of the incident. <clears throat> it's possible that in contrast to Luke's initial reports that she looked like a tramp, the victim was actually very wealthy. A person with two homes, say, wouldn't be noticed as a missing person in the same way someone with one home would be. But then again, such a person is much more likely to be reported missing in a timely manner. It's entirely possible that the driver killed a lonely and solitary old woman, someone with so few connections to the world around her that she may as well have been a ghost. God, that's sad. As a result of such a lifestyle, it stands to reason that her killer may never face justice. Until detectives find her remains, she's doomed to remain in a Schrodinger-like state. Yeah, I, sti I love that, how like they have all the evidence that he killed someone. Yeah, I hit someone. Who was it? I don't know. All right, well, you're free to go. We don't have, we don't, we don't know. We don't know who you killed, so. A victim who both does and doesn't exist. And until it's proven that she does, her killer will continue to walk free. Brandon Swanson was born on the 30th of January, 1989, and spent his formative years in the city of Marshall, Minnesota. Following his Minnesota! graduation from high school in 2007, Brandon enrolled at the Minnesota, Minnesota West Community and Technical College and studied wind turbines. He proved himself to be a dedicated student who wished only to contribute to a brighter, greener future. When the academic year came to an end on May 13th, 2008, Brandon and his friends celebrated by attending two separate parties, both held in the- A guy named Brandon who lives in Minnesota? Let's go! I hate, I hate, I hate everything. College students' dormitories. Friends of Brandon's later said that he drank at both parties but knowing that he had to drive home later that night, did so conservatively <clears throat> yeah, let's not. to ensure that he was let's under the legal not. limit. He was, by all accounts, of clear and sober mind Don't say it, when King. he left. Don't say it. Shortly after midnight, Brandon said his goodbyes and got into the driver's side seat of his Chevrolet Lumina. He then began dude, the 30 mile- me, Dude, me and my wife both, both had a Chevy Lumina, Lumina when we were younger. I'll drive back to his hometown of Marshall. It was a simple, southeasterly drive, one that should have taken no longer than 30 to 40 minutes. But for some reason, Brandon was still on the road at around 1.45 a.m. It was at that time that his journey was brought to a screeching halt. Brandon telephoned his parents, Brian and Annette, and told them that he had crashed his car into a roadside ditch. A childhood injury had left him near blind in one eye which affected both his night vision and death perception. So although alarming, the accident wasn't altogether surprising. Brandon was shaken, but assured both his parents that he was unharmed, and asked if they could drive out and give him a ride back home. Brian and Annette got into their pickup truck and drove along Highway 68 in the direction they believed their son was stranded. There was just one problem. Brandon didn't know exactly where he was, as he had almost certainly taken a wrong turn at some point oh, in his journey. No. Given the layout of the area, he may well have been suffering from familiarity displacement and wound up somewhere he had never been before. As such, his parents kept him on the phone, telling him to use his flashlight to signal passing cars so that they'd be able to find him. Oh no. Brian and Annette continued along Highway 68, but after driving for around half an hour, they failed to spot any flashlights at the roadside. Brandon's father realized that his son must not be on Highway 68 after all, 
and so asked him if he could spot the lights of any towns around him. When Brandon replied that he could, his father suspected that the lights were coming from the small town of Lind, roughly seven miles southwest of Marshall. Brian told his son to walk towards that town so that they could meet somewhere they were both familiar with. Oh no. The parking lot of a popular bar and grill. Brandon stayed on the line as he cut through some fields. He and his father had been on the phone for exactly 47 minutes by that point, and it seemed just a matter of time before they were reunited. And yet, just after 2.30am, Annette and Brian heard something on the other end of the line that would replay in their minds for the rest of their lives. Without warning, Brandon suddenly screamed, Oh shit! as if taken by surprise before falling completely silent. His father called out his name into the phone, but there was no response. Thinking that they had lost connection, Brian hung up and tried calling Brandon back, but there was no answer. Brian began ceaselessly calling his son's phone, but the longer Brandon- Why would- I don't understand. The better option would be to stay there, not walk to a town. Brandon failed to answer, the more it became obvious that something was wrong. Unable to find any trace of their son along the roadside, Brandon's parents reported him missing as soon as they were able to. But to their frustration, local law enforcement seemed completely disinterested. Classic. Classic. One officer told them that it was, quote, hardly unusual for young men that age to stay out all night after the last day of college. Oh my God. While another God. seemed to imply that the Swansons were being controlling. Oh my Brian later said what? that that same officer- They blamed the parents? Beautiful. Beautiful. Officer had told them that Brandon had a right to go missing, and refused to investigate until there had been no contact for 24 hours. Brandon we gotta make sure he's- really missing before we actually go search for him. You know, 24 hours is a lot of time and, you know, they probably could die by then, but let's just wait. Let's wait till he's dead and then we'll search for him, you know? Lynn's parents were forced to take their case to Lynn's chief of police. And after an impassioned plea, a search party was finally formed. A few hours later, police officers located Brandon's abandoned Chevy. It was lying in a ditch just as he had described, and although there were no signs of foul play, there were also no signs of Brandon anywhere. When his cell phone was traced to nearby Yellow Medicine County, multiple search teams used bloodhounds and helicopters to scour the area. Later that day, one of the dogs picked up a scent. Search and rescue personnel followed the dog along a three-mile trail which snaked through nearby fields in the direction of an abandoned farm. From that farm, the tracker dog followed Brandon's trail to the Yellow Medicine River, where the scent abruptly disappeared. Uh oh. When Brandon's father confirmed that his son had heard running water as he had walked, detectives began to suspect that he may have fallen into the river and drowned. Yeah, but how? How like how would he just like drown? Unless the river was like specially trained divers combed through the river, but no trace of Brandon was discovered. Sadly, less than one week after Brandon went missing, local law enforcement were forced to scale back their search for him. Given how long he had been gone, it stood to reason- Yeah, what is- What is it being dark have to do with not being able to swim? I mean, I guess if he just didn't know how to swim. But you guys know how, like, rivers are. It's not just, like, a one drop-off. It, like, gradually goes in, right? So w wouldn't he just like, at, like, you know, slip and fall into shallow water and walk out? It really makes that sense. There was only a slim chance he was still alive. Some weren't so cynical. Brandon's parents, along with almost every home in his neighborhood, kept their porch lights on as a symbol of their hope that Brandon would eventually return. Sheriff Fizeki also held out hope and continued to walk the two- There's different rivers. Okay, so you're telling me there's a river that at the exact shoreline where the water starts, it's just a straight drop off of like 10 feet. That there's a river that exists that it does that. 
like right when right when it hits the shoreline you just boom straight any yeah that happens no it doesn't that's stupid yeah some rivers have that no 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 i don't believe that i'm chat i'm talking about at the actual right here the, the where the dry land meets the wetland yes rock walls I'm not talking about like a, a, a fucking wall that you, a rock wall you jump off of. I'm talking if, if it is like a shoreline right here, touching water, it does it doesn't just, it doesn't just fucking do that. It goes down. It goes down. And then it, it does, it's not a fucking, no. There are drop-offs within a river. But I'm I'm talking about the shoreline, ladies and gentlemen. Shorelines do not have a like straight down. It doesn't do that. It don't go down. It don't go down. I know what I know there's are drop-offs. Like when you get deeper into water, there is like a there are drop-offs. What if you walked off a cliff? Well then he would have said that. Would he not have? He said that there was just a river nearby. He didn't say there are giant cliffs, 10, uh, 100 feet tall, that he did a backflip off of, you know? I feel like that would be an important matter to say. When he says just a river, I assume just a basic ass river. Pig is a shoreline expert. No, I have common sense. You don't need to be a shoreline expert to have common sense. Two mile search area along the Yellow Medicine River on a daily basis for the next. All right, let's 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 look up the Yellow Medicine River. Hmm. Does that look like it goes thunk? It doesn't. It goes like it goes like this. It is angled. Right here. If we zoom in, that's an angle. It goes like that. It doesn't go to the shore and then pukunk right there. It doesn't fucking do that. No. He would be fine. It's not even like a raging river. It's just like. It's a chill river. How deep is the river? Hmm. Let me see. About five. Maybe six. Doesn't say how deep it is anywhere. That's the wrong video. Next month. By autumn of 2008. The sheriff had organized a large, cross-county task force to search the freshly harvested fields surrounding Highway 68. One of the major impediments to the original search had been the ocean of corn and wheat stalks covering inches, feet, or yards. Maybe seven. Covering the search area, some of which dwarfed even the tallest members of the search crew. With such a huge obstacle now gone, Sheriff Vasecki knew there was no better time to continue the search. Almost immediately, cadaver dogs began to pick up on the scent of human remains in a previously unsearched area. Again, no physical evidence was found, but the scent was found yeah, around seven an area liquids. with farming seven equipment, liquids deep. leading some to theorize seven that buckets. Brandon may have been pulverized by a harvester. Oh! By the spring of 2011, more than 122 square miles... Okay, I feel like his parents would have been able to hear that though, right? ...square miles have been searched. But despite such a mammoth effort, not a single usable lead was recovered. It was like Brandon had simply dropped off the face of the earth. No trace of the young man could be found anywhere. As far as tangible theories are concerned, there's very little evidence to suggest that Brandon drowned that night. Hmm. He was only within earshot of the Yellow Medicine hmm. River. Hmm. Hmm. No, but apparently everyone's about the fukunk and I was right. I was right, so shut up, you stupid bitch. Not nearly close enough to fall in. And when a tracker dog did follow Brandon's scent trail to the water, it continued to the other side and down a gravel road. 
His father, Brian, also insisted that his son didn't seem disoriented or intoxicated during their phone conversation. That don't mean nothing. Yes, There's it little does. evidence that They Brian literally scoured the fucking river and had dogs and even caught a scent on the other side of the river. I'm right, you're wrong. Get over it. Get over it. And ran away from home either. He and his parents had a close and loving relationship. Enough so that his first thought was to call them when he got in trouble. Even if he had run away, surely there would have been sightings of him in the area during the days that followed. The one possibility that can't be ruled out is foul play. That's the explanation that Sheriff Vizeki is most invested in. In his, I mean, like he did cross farmland, and if you guys know farmers. Opinion. They're weird. The they, fact can get that weird man. Final word they can get weird. Was a single, terrified expletive tells him all he needs to know. Someone could have been lurking in the shadows, he later said. They got him that way. Question is, who are they exactly? Some purport that Brandon fell victim to a mysterious serial slayer. Highway 68 is frequented by hundreds of long-haul truckers every single day. Truckers Many of the most well. prolific slayers in American history have been truckers. It's entirely feasible that Brandon was held up, marched or driven off to a different location somewhere in Yellow Medicine County, and then slaughtered and disposed of in a way that left no trace. But what if he wasn't killed? What if that final expletive was prompted by the sight of someone who wished to keep him a terrified prisoner. One to be tormented daily, long after those that loved him believed he had passed on. One to be trafficked and sold. In the absence of any solid explanation, it's impossible not to examine every possibility, even if some potential theories seem a bit eccentric. But perhaps blaming human traffickers is simply a way to rebrand the hope of Brandon's eventual return. If he is indeed alive and being held somewhere, then there's always that slim chance that he might escape, and that he and his parents will someday be reunited. Frankly, the alternative is too grim to contemplate, because if true, it means that one night, after making a relatively simple mistake, a promising young man was snatched away from this world, and his loving parents, who will forever grieve his loss, were listening at the exact moment it happened. <clears throat> that sucks. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribe? I'll thank you either way. You know will miss you I hope you return tell your friend or your mother to get me more views please